So after all this discussion, we're going to try to certainly begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you for all your good gifts of life, our family, friends, the church, our faith, and our country. I ask your blessing upon all of us so we can continue to live in your light, in your truth, and in your peace as we pray. Glory be to the Father, and, and to, to the, the Son, Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was, was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and ever shall be, world without end. end. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, so I want to start with the, with the that glory be prayer, um, just to underline some stuff. Um, after the council, Vatican II, um, the, they reformed, you know, the mass, the liturgy, okay? They also did the liturgy of the hours, which is the office. We call it the office, morning prayer, evening prayer, all the, the, the different times of prayer uh, that, that the monastics will pray. At the end of each psalm, you do a glory, you say glory be to the Father. And we change the words to a better translation from the Latin. Have you ever noticed that what we pray, like with the rosary and, and the, the Gloria, the glory be, um, it, the, the last line is kind of incorrect, okay? And it's a bad translation. I don't know the history of who translated it. I suspect it goes back to the, you know, whatever, 1600s, but I don't know, back into England. It's an English translation, so England, Ireland, somewhere. So we've learned this prayer as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Question mark. Yeah. Yeah, but okay. we just told them that end of time. Right. Right. So <laughs> I just noticed that the world, question. when you say world, the world, world without end, that's implying that this is going on forever, this world. So that is incorrect. So the religious, the priests, nuns, you know, when you pray in the office, you say it in a different ending. So the way we would pray. So if you go to, you know, a, a convent or a monastery, or something, you'll hear them pray this way: "Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever." Nothing about world without end. It will be forever. The glory of God will be forever. There's Changes a, in the be glory to the Father. Glory to the Father. Yeah, glory be. Yeah, yeah, when we say glory be, the glory, yeah, we would also yeah, glory to the Father. Yeah, yeah. Glory, glory, well, most people say the be in there anyway, because it's yeah. we're used to it. But we do the, we do the different ending, you know, the, 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 the better adaptation. So, um, so with that too, um, at, in 2011, Pope Benedict uh, wanted to go and kind of reform the English translations of the Mass that were done in the 70s, 1970, I guess. And we learned, you know, the new creed. The, you know, we, we, we all got the cards and the pews and everybody would have to, you know, begin to try to learn how to pray the creed and the gloria and all kinds of things. The Lord be with you and with your spirit, okay? So he wanted to have the English speakers follow the Latin translation, that's the normative translation, the normative text, in Latin, that the French and the Germans and everybody else comes off of. Okay, so so we changed one big deal was the, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Okay, so we we were saying we believe now. Okay, all right. So it's interesting. We believe. Well, I don't know what he believes. He's maybe he's a Hindu. What are we saying? We. So the creed really wanted, the, the church really wanted, and it has always been, I believe, you know, since it's credo in Unum Deo, credo, first person. So I believe. So we went back to that. So the Gloria um, also got uh, revamped and retranslated. And let me go there. Um, Three right. So <clears throat> the Gloria comes, of course, in the beginning of the Mass. It really is when you're really transforming your mind and your heart, hopefully, as you're trying to pay attention, from you know secular and outside world, mundane world, into sacred space. So the song of the Gloria um, is meant to be sung. And if you ever get to take a look at the sacramentary, that's the priest book, 
that he has on the altar, has all the sacraments in there, marriage and every funeral, is, it's all in there. So the church includes first, as you're going through the page, you turn the page, you see the Gloria with music notes, with plain chant. Now I've never learned it myself. I really, that's the thing I'm gonna to try to start working on. So I can chant the Gloria and let people be able to know how to do that. We all know the Our Father pretty good now. Most Catholics have heard that along the way and, and sing the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Okay. Never did it. So it's a simple chant. Oh, you never did it? No? Oh, okay. Well, you know, we'll got you again. Got to get you in there somehow. Don't we do it? We do I went to Catholic school. We do no, it here. Well, it, it, yeah, yeah. It's, we, yeah. Do, we do it here. We yeah. sing it. Yeah. On a, sun, on a sun, regular yeah. Sunday? Yeah. And Sun we sing the glory, too. Yeah. Where did I go now here? Um, here we are. Okay. So, um, <coughs> so the glory is meant to be sung. So the t so in the in the sacramentary it has music with musical notes. Okay. So you're supposed to do that. Anything that has musical notes in, you're supposed to be singing. So the church wants us to sing. Um, you know, he, those who sing pray twice. You know, it's like. It's, it's well, Saint, Saint Augustine. Well, it, that's the plain chant. So it should be. The, now we have many glorias now that composers have made, but the ones that were done from like 1970 to um, to 2011, there, whatever, back in there, a lot of those composers took great liberties in changing the words on the prayer. So if they like Gloria, 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 you know, do something, and it's not the prayer. So Pope Benedict said, okay, you can compose what you like with music, but this is the text. Don't mess with the text. Because this is the prayer um, that we begin the Mass. So it's like a transformative prayer. It's certainly for me, uh, you know, I'm always running in, you know, late or whatever, coming into Mass. This is, this is a busy, busy and, and okay, Lord have mercy, you get that done. But the Gloria, I really try to pray it, you know, pay attention, even if we're saying it. Even if we're saying, like yesterday was a feast day, I had 10 people or 15 people for the Mass, whatever, and we had, uh, we, we, we prayed it, we didn't sing it. I wish I could have sung it, though, if I could have chanted it, but I'm not practiced enough yet to do it. So, um, so it, 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 you, of course, you can pray it, and oftentimes in a small crowd or whatever, they will, and without a choir, we'll pray it, and that's okay. But just to ponder, pray it with your heart, pray it with your heart, look at the words and ponder the words. When uh, Scott Hahn uh, made his like, journey, uh, conversion, he was a biblical scholar, he had all this knowledge and stuff, and he decided to go to, first time to go into a mass, and he tells the story that he was shocked that every word is scripture, pretty much from the mass. Every word is found in scripture. So the Gloria, he was like, wow, it's, Okay, so where is that from? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. Um, where is that from? The Annunciation. Not the Annunciation. The Nativity. Well, it's the shepherds. The shepherds. Okay. Right, okay. the shepherds, you know, here in the shepherd's field. Glory to God in the highest, right? So when you go there, it's really cool to be saying the glory of there. That's kind of cool, you know, to be there. There, there that song, whoa, you know, that the Christmas song. And it's so cool. We were there and in the in the church, and um, we we started singing it. And then this Indonesian crowd came in, and they sang their verse in Indonesian. You know, same melody. Same melody with the, in Indonesian. Then a Korean crowd came in. We had Korean, oh, wow. and we all joined in on the Gloria because that was nice. that was the same. It was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So really, you know. So glory to God in the highest. It really is a prayer of praise. So put yourself in that spirit, you know, and, and get caught up in the prayer um, as, as it's prayed. Because And sometimes presiders, God bless them, you know, glory to God in the highest. Lord, peace be with you. Remember, I give you a glory to God. So try not to do that. <laughs> try, to, try to give it a punch, even if you're praying and not singing it. But... Um, but the words here were changed a little bit, okay? It was glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth, okay? Well, hmm, 
glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. Not all the earth, not all the earth is going to be in the peace of God. Okay. And, you know, not all the earth is doing that, unfortunately, right? So it's interesting. It makes this the kind of specification of the, of the people, mm -hmm. you know, and on the earth, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to people of goodwill, okay? So we are praising God in the, with the general name, God, okay? We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glories. Now that's a prayer to God, in a sense, the Trinity itself, kind of the oneness of God. So it's a prayer and praise to God. Then it, it explains, Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father. So now we're naming God, Father Almighty. So it gives uh, the person of the Father. So first it's a general praise of God, then it zeroes in uh, on the Father, you know, Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father. So all that praise is for the Father, then we switch to the Son, Lord Jesus Christ. And it's cool when the, when the composer changes somehow the, the, the melody and that you know you're, you're, you're doing something different now. We, we've given glory to God, then specifically to the Father, and then we move into the Son. So, <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father. So again, three titles there again, all these, three, like threes are happening here. Remember the three, mean to mean it, you know, first time you do something, eh. second time you do something, maybe coincidence. Third time you do it, that's it. So it's the Middle East mindset is right here. So Lord, um, so titles, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Then you get three mercies, you know, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Okay, so it's all three, three prayers for mercy. Um, you are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us, there's your other mercy. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. And one of the ladies said, that's when I bow my head. Yeah, it's good to bow your head there in the name of Jesus Christ. We were taught that when we were little kids. Um, it's a good thing to do, you know. Um, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. And finally, we hear the Spirit. With the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. So it's a beautiful, um, beautiful prayer, praising the Trinity and the oneness of God. All of it is in there. It's all, it's all you know, the oneness of God and the Trinitarian nature of God, Father, Son, and Spirit are all present in one prayer. And it's a praise, praise, a, a, a prayer of praise. So it can be sung, uh, it's great, great, but now they do, when the composers are putting that music to, uh, the words to the music, they can't take any liberties. You have to state everything. You can't just like praise Jesus and not the Spirit and not the Father. Some got into really liberties of, of changing the words a little bit. So so we want a little standardization there that, that what the church prays is what the church believes. So we talked about that phrase, lex credendi, lex orandi. The, the law of belief affects the law of prayer, the way we pray, the, the doing of the prayer. And the, the prayer that we do affects the belief that we have. So it's important to keep the words, you know, as you know, correct words. Um, so, good. All right. So, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay. So... That's our for Marino for today. So last uh, last time we are going to try to get to the book again. We always get into <laughs> all kinds of discussion here and there and everywhere. Um, <clears throat> we're on page 444. If you're there. Um, 
we've been talking about, uh, we're in the 1500s, we're talking about humanism, and humanism as, uh, as the move toward this world. The church embraced humanism, many people in the church. We talked about St. Thomas More, I think, mm -hmm. last week, a little bit of a week ago. Thomas More being a good uh, example of somebody who was well-learned, he knew the, the sciences, theology, philosophy, languages, he was a Renaissance man, you call that like a Renaissance man, who was able to incorporate um, this new knowledge and the new, new information coming through uh, uh, his, his own studies. And a saint, you know, he stood up to Henry VIII, he, he said, uh, you know, the Pope is the head of the church, not the King of England, and he paid, he paid the price. Um, but a holy, a holy man in the, in, of his time, who was able to also say, we can pay attention to this world. Now, the medieval mindset did have, have a lot of attention on heaven. So all the art and the music, all the rest, was all religious. Now, people start doing other things with music and with art. Um, and I like I use the example of peaches. I mean, people started painting pictures of peaches. Well, I love peaches. Peaches are beautiful. Pe you know, God made peaches, so it's okay. We can pay attention to peaches and pay attention to portraits of people, regular people. Uh, everything doesn't have to be saints and the Blessed Mother and, you know, images like this. So, so the, the arts begin to shift a little bit um, to this world, to look at this world, examine this world, know this world, and cherish, you know, cherish this world. God created it. So, so it, it was really not a big deal for, you know, for Catholic humanism, a Christian humanism to, you know, evolve and, and accept, okay, we need to discover more about this world and, and the next. But keeping the two together was, you know, just natural for most folks. But, you know, Erasmus comes along, he's another writer, um, and he, uh, you know, a thinker, crit crit critiquing though, looking at, look at, well, how, how is the church running now? How is the world running now? And we can critique it. We can try to make it better. We have to look and see um, how we can begin to, you know, tweak what we, what we see. So the, the, that with knowledge, you know, we can try to perfect this world. We should try to do that. And that's a godly thing to do. It's not anti-God. So humanism is not an, a bad word for Christians, Catholics. Um, it's a good thing, humanism. It's the focusing on human life and what, you know, where we, where we are. Now, uh, we talked uh, a little bit, and it's interesting put this, putting this together. With Thomas More, he writes that book, though, that book called Utopia. Okay? He writes a book called Utopia, and in that book, he's critiquing you know, kind of the church and, and the monarchy and life in his day. And he paints a picture of what it could be. If everybody was religious, everybody was good, everybody was doing the right thing, everybody. And he called it utopia for the purpose of saying utopia means no place. Mm. All right. It doesn't exist. He's showing this would be great. This is the high bar. I hope wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get there? But he called the book Utopia. It's not going to be in this world. Never going to be perfect. Okay? So this connects to what we call Catholic Christian anthropology. Who are we as human beings? It makes a difference if you think you're a son or daughter of God or slime from a swamp makes a difference. Okay? So if you have a religious background, I mean, you have a religious stance, your anthropology is Christian, Judeo-Christian, okay? We created in the image and likeness of God. We share Godness somehow. The spark is in there. So these, this, now we're gonna get into this other fellow um, Rabelais, I think is how you pronounce his name, the French philosopher, and he used to give him as an example of what begins to crack in the in Western culture. 
So whereas these, these people like Erasmus or Thomas More could, you know, look at the world and, and critique it and try to hope for better, okay, this fellow is going to come up with a whole other idea. Okay, so he's, his dates are 1490 to 1553. So, though many of the early humanists neither sought to reject Christianity nor escape its moral demands, the ide ideological forces driving the humanistic movement with its new fascination with worldly life led some humanists to turn disdainfully against the morality and the theological education of the medieval period. Okay? Now some people are going to say, well, you know what, I don't believe it. You know, this, is the, this, is, this is what moves into what we call now secular humanism, okay, which, is, which will be atheistic. We'll eventually really get toward there. That there is no God, okay? And one of, one, so this fellow, okay, he's, he's critiquing his world, and he, he sees the, the corruption of the church and the monarchies and all this stuff, and so he's, he's really getting a bad, bad taste. And so he really starts moving into secular, you know, the secular world. All right, I'm just going to pay attention to this world, and I'm going to try to make this world better according to what I've learned and know, not by morality or theology. And I'm going to, you know, I'm, I can, if we just knew enough, we could fix everything. Oh boy, watch out for that. <laughs> okay, it's pride. yeah, that's a well, sure. It's pride, <laughs> and it's uh, yeah. So, all right. So, consequently, uh, the more cynical and critical humanists embraced, both in their writings and in their lives, a wholly secular and worldly existence comes about. The French satirist Rabelais, a brilliant scholar and literary genius who had mastered Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, penned the uh, farcical, chaotic adventures, this is the you know, book that he wrote here, The Life of Gargantua and the Heroic Deeds of Pantagruel, which appeared serially from 1533 until shortly after his death. Rabelais was highly reactionary in his writings, and this most likely contributed to his reaction to monastic ideals. So the monasteries, he's critiquing the monasteries, what's going on in, in the monasteries. Rabelais' giants engage in a ridiculous series of bawdy, obscene, and licentious adventures. And in the process, simultaneously critique and celebrate man. So he sees the bad, but he celebrates that, okay, this is human life. This is, this is a good thing, okay, it's a good thing. Um, no one is safe in his, you know, in the writings, monks, priests, scholars, Protestants, Catholics, but it is ultimately man who is by nature good, who is elevated. Okay, there we go, right? So he's elevating man because he believes man to be good and without God, okay, without God. So there is this uh, desire within this whole stream of, of people that we, that we are good, moral, good beings. Catholic and Jewish anthropology says we are good, but our human nature is cracked. All right, there's, there's gonna be sin. Even after original sin is wiped away in baptism, we still have a tendency <coughs> toward, toward sin. But our job in this world is to perfect. So Western Christians call that sanctification, the call to holiness. We know saints get there. We know some of these people and we like to point them out. <laughs> we say, look, there's a saint. Okay, he's done a good job in this world. He's worked his journey. But it's gonna be by God's grace and faith in Christ and connection to the Holy Spirit that's gonna help elevate humanity. And that is necessary. There's no way. But this, these folks start saying, well, we're born good. And anything that we do is probably good. We're going, if we only had enough knowledge and insight, then we can make this world perfect. So that's 
chasing after utopia, chasing after utopia, but it's never going to be. So you're eventually going to get to the communists and socialist kind of idea that we can keep tweaking and tweaking humanity and we're going to make it better. And we're going to make it better for everybody. So okay. Where we are now. Uh, that's where we are now. This is so. This is where we're. This is the why it's been to know some of this stuff. This is when the the cracks begin to happen in in what was in Christendom. Mm -hmm. It was Christendom. Everybody's on the same page. Everybody doesn't mean everyone's perfect time and all that stuff. But but on the same page. So basic ideas of of who we are as hum, as human beings. Most people understood it. But here goes now the intelligentsia starting to. You know, hmm, so we're know. back in 1553 now. <laughs> well, we're we're at the end. I mean, we're we're after a whole bunch of stuff. So, so what happened? You know, you get some of these people talking like this and thinking like this, and eventually it, you know, more and more of the culture now trickles down. Trickles down. So now here we are. That most people are not religious and happy to be not religious. So where this begins here, this, this idea of secular humanism um, starts among a few people. Obviously, they had influence as the centuries have gone by. So now it's kind of where most folks are at at this point. So I like to use that expression, you know, slime from swamp. You know, and the most you can hope for is recycle. <laughs> that's, your, that's your destiny. Go back to the swamp. And I can, you know, do do something else after that. So this is you know, fascinating, you know, that you hear this fellow here um, kind of begin with this. He, he changes anthropology. You know, we're good, we're smart, we don't need God. We can find our own way. So this is really, ooh, it's a the pridefulness. But that's also what happened in the Old Testament too. So, yeah, you know, it's the right. Yeah, there's always, there's yeah. always, yeah, there's always. Yeah. But but uh, but we believe you know that um, our our call in this world, our life in this world, is meant for sanctification. That we should be holier and more godlike. The, the the Eastern Christians call it divinization. They really put the big work on there, you know, to become like God. And that's God's intent that we will be with Him eternally. So that's God's intention for us. It's our our destiny. So um, when we cooperate with grace and, and we move through our lives, um, yes, we learn and we heal, but that, that broken, that crackedness in our human nature, yeah, there is, there's always sin, there's always sin. And we battle it and we can progress. Yeah, that's, that's Christian anthropology. Some of these folks will just say, well, we don't worry about, you know, we, we'll, we'll do the best we can. We'll just do the best we can. With, with more knowledge, with more insight, we will we'll fix everything. And wow, I think it's getting <laughs> a little more tr problematic these days as we, as we look at all this stuff. So um, yesterday, and now I'm going to get into the popes, and I just wanted to finish up with uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, finish up with yesterday was the the chair of of Peter. And I finally found the scripture that um, when Jesus says uh, yesterday's scripture was, uh, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So Jesus wasn't making that up. You know, he gave us, um, he gave, gave those keys to Peter. When he did that, he was doing what Jewish kings have done throughout the thousand years before him. So he didn't make this idea up out of thin air. He was doing what Jewish kings do, appointing a prime minister. So just like Queen of England has the prime minister, um, Boris uh, Johnson, um, and he's the one that kind of runs the show. And especially when the, when the king or the queen is absent this one is taking charge. So when Jesus does that, um, he is doing um, what Jewish kings did. And he, of course, is king of kings himself. So now he's appointing. And the, the scriptural basis for that, I finally did find it, look, looked it up. And it's and it was interesting yesterday was 2, 2, 2 
22, 22, you know. <laughs> so it's actually, it is Isaiah 22, 22. Really? really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. So if you look up Isaiah 22, 22. Okay, so um, he's saying, and I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. So it is about, so what was going on there, all the kings would have a prime minister, and there would be this ceremony of giving up the keys. So just to tie that in to, uh, into the Jewish, again, Jewish roots of, of our faith, that Jesus didn't make that up out of nowhere. He just said, okay, Peter, you know, I'm going to make you, you know, give you the keys of the kingdom. That's a long story, again, that has connections back to the Old Testament. So I just wanted to finish with that because, okay, now you got the keys. Now, in Jewish history, there's great kings and terrible kings. And there's great prime ministers and bad prime ministers. So now, as we go next week, we'll start doing the popes, <laughs> the popes of the Renaissance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we do have a super king, Jesus, and some of his prime ministers on, on this side of uh, the world of heaven, you know, um, haven't been the best. <laughs> so, so sometimes like we are the same. Yeah, your else. prime ministers are, are sometimes not so great. Okay, so we'll get into that next week. So that'll be.